providing project financing for banks, industries and businesses. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development invests in projects that could not attract finance on similar terms, paving the way for much needed development. Joining me now is Thomas Meyer and Matthew Jordan Tank from the bank. Well, Thomas, let's start with non conventional PPPs. How do you structure these? So, as you know, all our projects are in sometimes difficult emerging markets. And so, for us, the, the, the challenge is not so much to come up with non conventional structures than to apply best practice that we have seen elsewhere in emerging markets and mature markets. And in reality, there are three elements that make a good PPP project. One is uh, that the project itself addresses an underlying demand that is long-term, stable and goes beyond political cycles. We and investors look for stable regulatory and legal environment. And thirdly, the underlying cash flow of a project, and that is a topic we're going to discuss here in, in, in more detail, has to be stable, predictable and solid so that both financiers and operators come in. And what role do institutional investors play in PPPs and project finance? Historically, institutional investors were not very active in our region, but recently this seems to be changing. Uh, for example, we, last year we financed the R1 toll motorway in Slovakia, or rather refinanced that transaction, and we could attract a fair number of European institutional investors such as insurance companies and pension funds. Altogether about 1.2 billion was raised in this market with EBRD and KFW as anchor investors. So we do see that there is a, an increased interest by institutional investors because emerging markets provide an interesting uh, yield for, for these investors provided the transactions themselves are well structured. Matthew, moving on to the regulatory side of things now, and how is urban transport as a sub-sector controlled? As you know, urban transport involves much more than just public transport. It's also about uh, users who, who drive private cars. It's other users who are pedestrians, non-motorized uh, 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 transport as well. So it's a complex environment on the street. What you're really trying to do at the end of the day is provide a balanced approach to all those different modes of transport. So for very, very large cities, what we do and what we've seen is that there's a need to establish what's known as a transport regulator, um, a transport agency or authority. We're here in London and TFL is a good example of, of that for a very large city. Um, in the smaller cities, you can do this type of good regulation with a transport department. But in both cases, what you need is very well-trained, well-prepared um, professionals who understand the dynamics of, of regulatory environments in urban transport. And part of the main, one of the main things we do is, uh, with our development side of EBRD is to really do uh, capacity building, institutional strengthening for our counterparts. How do public service contracts fit into all of this? What a PSC essentially does is establish is a two-way relationship in a, balanced, in a balanced environment. On the one hand, you have the public, the owner of, 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 of the operator, who will be uh, essentially providing a service. So you've got an owner and a service provider, and this PSC is a long-term, typically a 10-year contract that governs that relationship. Um, what you're trying to do in the PSC is establish the, the, the roles and, reg, roles and uh, regulations around the operation so that in exchange for providing a good high quality service, the operator is remunerated uh, 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 sufficiently. And that's the way to achieve sustainability by means of, of this PSC instrument. What is the underlying revenue stream for the public sector and how do you incorporate performance-based subsidies? Performance-based payments, really, these are public sector payments, known as subsidies, uh, typically. Um, they are performance-based in the sense that they are defined in, in, in the PSC, in the formula. The formula is essentially, um, has two sources of, of, of revenue. One is from users, and this is, is to begin with, it's, it's the basis of all, all good, sustainable uh, transportation uh, environments. It's when users are willing to pay a healthy amount for the service that they're, they're receiving. That's the user pays principle. The other side is when, when there is a gap, a financial gap, between the total cost of delivering the service and, 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 and what is actually received from users, that's where the public sector comes in with, with this sort of performance-based subsidy payment. And that's all defined in the PSC formula. And Thomas, finally, what makes a project credit worthy? There are additional hurdles that a project needs to meet when it is in emerging markets simply because the track record of the market itself may not be as 
complete as in a mature market and the legal and regulatory framework may be less ideal than it is in certain EU countries. This is where we are coming in as well with additional uh, services. Uh, for example, we help many of our public sector clients in structuring projects to a, to a level where they become attractive to the market. Our own investment is important for many investors and operators because our non-performing loan ratio in infrastructure in particular is very low, which means that we generally tend to look and seek the right partners and the right projects. And lastly, we can provide local currency loans and investments uh, which is extremely important in infrastructure space because many of these projects only generate local uh, currency and therefore providing local currency financing hedges against devaluation risk. Thomas, Matthew, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.